Hello everyone, in this video I will briefly speak to you about one half of the Nobel Prize in Physics that was recently awarded to environmental researchers. Being a doctoral student studying environmental physics, I'm super hyped about this and would like to share with you in very simple terms why these two scientists were given the Nobel Prize. Now the general reason for them winning the prize is simply that they advocated anthropogenic climate change. The scary word there, anthropogenic, comes from Anthropos, which means human in Greek, and Yenis, which roughly translates as a generation, so quite literally human-generated climate change. And let me tell you, not a lot of people were on board with the whole idea of climate change at the time. And I mean, they still aren't, but a lot of what was shown then, thanks in part to scientists like these two Nobel laureates, has been partly proven now. In addition, their works are what led to modern-day climate models that climate science stands on today. A climate model, much like any model, is a simple representation of a system or process written down or on a computer that ideally can help us predict how the system will evolve over time. Now, unfortunately, I don't have the time to delve into all of their amazing works in this video, but we'll briefly talk about two manuscripts by each of the laureates that were fundamental in their contribution to understanding climate change and winning the Nobel Prize. So, first up, we got Shukuro Manabe a Japanese-American meteorologist and climatologist, and his paper titled Thermal Equilibrium of the Atmosphere with a Given Distribution of Relative Humidity by himself as well as co-author Richard Weatherold. Now, let's very quickly decipher this title and in doing so, the manuscript itself. Thermal equilibrium just means the system, and a system can be anything, although in this case, this atmosphere has reached the same temperature throughout. Let's say you put an ice cube in your drink. Neglecting warmth from everywhere else, at some point the cold ice cube will melt and as a result the warmer drink will cool, reaching an equilibrium temperature that is colder than what the drink had before you put the ice in, hence why we use ice cubes to cool our drinks. Now, Manabe focused on radiative convective equilibrium, which is just a model with a fixed energetic constraint that says that the cooling of the atmosphere by outgoing radiation must be balanced by the heat that the atmosphere receives. Which makes sense, right? The atmosphere is just a layer of gas. Energy that goes into it must equal the energy that comes out, which we know must be the case because of the first law of thermodynamics, or the law of conservation of energy. Using this simple model of incoming and outgoing radiation, it is possible to compute the thermal equilibrium of the atmosphere. What Manabe found was that instead of using absolute humidity, which is the measure of water vapor, which is just water in gas form or moisture in the air, it is better to use relative humidity for these radiative convective equilibrium computations. Why? Because absolute humidity just says for one meter of cubed air, there is some amount of grams of water in it, but says nothing about the temperature, even though it heavily depends on temperature, because cubic meters of warm air can have a lot more water than cubic meters of cold air. Relative humidity, on the other hand, is the amount of water vapor in the air as a percentage of the total amount that could be held at its current temperature. So warm air that is usually the champ when it comes to holding a lot of water suddenly has the same humidity as the wimpy cold air. Why? Because the little amount of water that the cold air parcel has is perhaps half as much as it can carry. And the large amount of water that the warm air parcel has is half of what it can carry, making their relative humidity equal. Now, Manabe found that radiative convective equilibrium computations are more accurate when we consider relative humidity instead of absolute humidity. Because let's face it, we have seasons on this planet and temperature changes constantly. Manabe justified his decision by showing that relative humidity on average doesn't really change globally regardless of the time of year. When a fixed relative humidity is used instead of for radiative convective equilibrium computations, the equilibrium temperature of the atmosphere starts to depend more upon the incoming solar radiation, which is important because it determines most of the input of energy into the atmosphere, and atmospheric absorbers like carbon dioxide. And this is where the Nobel Prize worthy prediction comes in as early as 1967, the year this manuscript was published. With this improved model, that uses relative humidity instead of absolute humidity, Manabe found that doubling of the existing carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere results in the surface temperature increasing by about 2.3 degrees Celsius. Now this is huge! The model from this manuscript that could accurately assess how different atmospheric absorbers impacted the thermal equilibrium of the atmosphere was truly the first of its kind. 
carbon dioxide aside, this is also the first study to identify rising temperatures result in more evaporation. So more water vapor, which results in more heat trapped within the atmosphere, because after all, water vapor is also an absorber. And the 2.3 degree increase in a time when some other papers were published on how carbon dioxide cools the atmosphere was phenomenal since it is well within the most recent estimates that are made today. This work, along with maybe this one, are what spurred climate science to develop models that could accurately predict climate change. Next, we have Klaus Hasselmann, a German oceanographer and climate modeler. Now, I'm already going over time with this video that I'd originally planned to be short, so I'm going to keep this next part even shorter, which works out because it's a little more complex, but here's the basic idea from Stochastic Climate Models Part 1 Theory. Again, we're going to look at the title and start there. There are two types of models, not just climate models, but models in general. Deterministic and stochastic. A deterministic model, you give it a set of initial conditions or some starting values, and you get a fixed trajectory or path. A stochastic model involves randomness. Every time you run the model, you get something slightly different, which again is in the name because stochastic comes from the Greek word stochos, which in this case is meant to mean aim or guess. In theory, you run a stochastic model enough times it will approach a deterministic trajectory. So why bother using stochastic models? Well, if the system exhibits randomness and we care about said randomness, a stochastic model will be better representation of the system we're modeling. That is exactly the case in the climate system. The coupled or connected ocean, atmosphere, cryosphere, land system is divided into a rapidly varying weather, essentially just the atmosphere, and a slowly responding climate system, the ocean, the cryosphere, the land vegetation, etc. Now up to this point, stochastic models weren't really used for the climate, and the random component of climate, what we refer to as weather, was not in climate models. Weather, random, what? Yes, weather is random. That's the reason why no weather app, and I don't care what you use, will be correct 100% of the time. And so Hasselmann in 1976, 10 years after Manabe's paper, found a way to integrate the random component of weather into coupled models, further improving them. How did he do it? Well, technicalities aside, the idea comes from Einstein, although it's named after botanist Robert Brown. Robert in 1827 described what he saw looking through a microscope at pollen grains immersed in water. He saw the pollen jiggling, so he assumed the pollen was alive. Now while yes, pollen grains like sperm cells, which is what they are for plants, are alive, that's not why they jiggled in the water. It would take about 80 years and a fellow named Einstein to describe why Brownian motion happens in 1905. Einstein showed with a, a model, full circle am I right? that the floating pollen grains were jiggling because of water molecules knocking the grains about. This would later inspire Jean Perrin to use Einstein's results to experimentally determine the mass and dimensions of atoms which got him, you guessed it, a Nobel Prize in 1926. Now almost a century later, the same story played out in which Einstein's work helped someone get a Nobel Prize. Hasselmann found that the climate system exhibits the same response characteristics as particles exhibiting Brownian motion, what we established as the jiggle to weather. In other words, the slow moving climate system is like a giant particle that is constantly being knocked about by weather. Averaging everything out, we get an approximate deterministic trajectory of how the climate evolves. He also found that without stabilizing internal feedback loops, all this randomness would result in climate variability growing indefinitely. And if you don't know what stabilizing feedback loops are, let me refer you to my first video on Arctic amplification and where I define and give examples of feedback loops. With that, I'd like to thank you for watching. If you liked the video, then like the video. And if you enjoyed the content, then please subscribe and hit that notification bell for Arctic amplification part two coming soon. Last but not least, I would like to congratulate all three of the physics Nobel laureates and regret not having the time in this video to also cover the work by Giorgio Parisi on disorder and fluctuations in physical systems, which although I am maybe not as qualified to cover, I'd still be up for digging into and presenting his work to you guys at your request. And with that, peace out.